everyone. I'm Martha Zavala, president of the League of Women Voters Pasadena area. Welcome to Thursday with the League redistricting. We drew the lines, what's next? Before we get to our program, let's take a moment to honor the significant contributions volunteers make. They generously donate their time and talents to worthy causes so that others may benefit from their work. Uh, thank you to our league members. The work you do is important. Little could be done without your tireless energy and commitment to inform voters about public policy issues that affect our communities. In a few short weeks, we will all be voting in the June 7th primary election. Remember that, we will all be voting. You should be getting your vote by mail ballots around May 9th, by May 9th. But I do know that our volunteers will be working double time just to make sure that our voters are informed and have the information you know they need to make their choices, the best choices they can for themselves and their communities. Thank you very much, volunteers. Uh, as you know, our league is 100% volunteers. So whenever you see them, they're doing pros and cons presentations. You see candidate forum facilitators and you see the people uh, working behind the scenes um, today. They are all completely uh, volunteers. So I just wanna tell them that I'm very proud to work with them. And before I introduce our featured speakers, Sean McMorris and Kaylin Perrache from Common Cause, uh, I'm gonna provide a brief summary of the program for this morning. Uh, we're gonna have our presenters come on and speak. And then after their presentation, uh, they will spend a few minutes taking questions from, uh, from you. Uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are not too familiar with Zoom, you can just hover down the bottom of your screen and you'll see that information pop up if it's not visible already. So then um, after their presentations, I'll present questions to them that come from you. So be aware that you uh, have the Q&A section of the feature down at the bottom. You can enter the questions there. They are subject to being edited, just to make sure that we don't have duplicates or that they are brief, briefly stated uh, so that every, and they're clear, clearly stated so that our speakers may respond to them. Now, we may not have time to include all your questions. If we don't get to yours, please be sure you email that to our events committee at events at lwv hyphen PA.org or to voter services at lwv-pa.org. Either one will get you, uh, try to get you an answer to your question. And please do not enter your questions or any comments in the chat box. We're going to use that, uh, just the webinar staff, so that we can keep things running smoothly. If you have concerns about anything, any sound or anything, you need to communicate with our Zoom staff. Just enter it into the Q&A and they'll field your question from there. So after our q and I'm gonna offer you an opportunity to take some action on pending legislation. We're gonna make a few announcements about upcoming events and other things before we close the meeting. And of course, as usual, we're very grateful to Pasadena Media they're recording this event and we'll post uh, the video to our YouTube channel in a few days for viewing. So if anybody that you know didn't get a chance to look at this or you think that they would be interested, you can let them know that they will be able to view this. Uh, today we have the, our speakers are from our treasured partner, Common Cause, Sean and Kaylin. If you could please turn on your videos and join me. That would be wonderful. Uh, let me introduce Sean McMorris. Uh, he's a journalist and a community organizer. Uh, advocate as a, He's an advocate for election reform and actually worked with us on reform in Alhambra and changing the county charter. And I think he did some work for the city of Los Angeles also. 
So he's really um, a program manager uh, with Common Cause right now, and he's focused on government ethics and transparency. And of course, those are all things that are near and dear to the league. So we love, really love having him here. I remember working with him for that charter change in Alhambra. And, uh, you know, I, I was really um, excited when I learned that he was going to be one of our speakers today. And with him is uh, Kaylin Peroche, and um, he's a regional redistricting um, uh, individual. And he was a primary monitor uh, in what, three of our jurisdictions, Pasadena, Alhambra, and, Al and Arcadia, among others. So hopefully we're gonna be able to hear some behind the scenes stories or maybe front <laughs> in the front scenes that we just didn't see um, about what went on in these uh, three cities that are in our community. So uh, Sean and Kaylin, welcome. Hello, welcome, thanks for having us. Thank you, I'm gonna cede the, the ground to you. So I'll see you in a few. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we'll just have the uh, our slide presentation put up here in a second. Oh, there it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're first of all very happy uh, to be here. Uh, and as Martha said, uh, we always uh, enjoy um, our partnership with uh, with the league. We work with them all over the state, uh, and it was a pleasure to work with the Pasadena Area League uh, for that Alhambra effort um, that was successful. Uh, so. Uh, good to be here, and uh, I'll just go ahead and jump right in to the uh, first part of our uh, presentation. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, just, just briefly, this is going to um, put our, uh, I've listed here kind of the order in which we're, the things that we're going to cover today uh, in our uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about what redistricting is. Uh, and uh, then we'll go uh, talk about why local redistricting is important. We won't spend a ton of time on these things. I know that the league members are, are a pretty good grasp on the importance of uh, redistricting. Uh, then we'll move on to the cycle uh, uh, this year, the, the 2020 slash 2021 redistricting cycle. And we'll talk about some of the good uh, and some of the bad things that happened uh, this cycle. Uh, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about redistricting's impact on voting, but you know what its potential impact might be on voting over the next 10 years. And finally, we'll we'll, we'll touch upon the outlook for redistricting moving forward and um, things that that may happen over the next 10 years, or things that we could uh, hopefully see or induce uh, to improve this process moving forward. And then we'll open it up to some some questions. Uh, next slide. So uh, let's let's just start right off and talk about uh, what redistricting is. Uh, next slide. So as we can see here, uh, we have a uh, kind of our fictitious city here that we're going to use for the next couple of slides. But uh, redistricting is, is is how communities are divided up to uh, ensure equal political representation, and this happens at the local, state, and federal levels of government. And just for fun, we'll we'll say that this example uh, box here with with our people in it, we'll we'll say it's a city called Happyville. Uh, next slide. So, the United States Constitution requires that political districts uh, of the same type have the same number of residents. Uh, this is called the principle of population equality. The goal of population equality is to make sure that each legislator represents the same number of people. So let's say we have a city with 20 people, uh, which will be our fictitious city here. Uh, there are four council districts. Uh, 20 divided by four is five. So you're aiming to have five people in each district uh, to have population equality. So this is true for districts at all levels of government, including congressional districts, state districts, and local districts. And I think if you right click on the mouse, um, some lines will pop up on the screen. It may, yeah, there we go. So uh, here we have a sample or an example of four districts. Uh, each district has five people each. So each elected official represents the same number of people. So we've reached uh, population equality here. Next slide. 
Uh, over time, however, population shifts. So, you know, children are born, people pass away, people move away because of gentrification or higher uh, housing costs. Uh, this means some places have population growth and other places have uh, decreases in population. Uh, because of this, districts become uneven uh, in size over the course of a decade. I think if you right click again, So, and we can see here now in this example, two districts on the right now contain more people than two districts on the left because of this, this natural shifting of populations over the course of a decade. Next slide. So every 10 years to compensate for this, this, these population shifts, the federal government counts everyone in the country. This is called the census. Uh, and after the census is finished, district boundaries must be redrawn to even out the size of each district. And this is now where we, we what we call redistricting. And it happens at all levels of government. Uh, in California, the district boundaries are draw, redrawn for Congress, the state legislature, county boards, city councils, and school boards. Uh, and this process of drawing new district maps is based on the census, census data that is collected. So in our city, uh, the population growth, if we can uh, right click again, we, we grew from 20 people to 24 people in the last 10 years in Happyville, our fictitious box here, and it did not grow evenly, you can see. So new district lines have, uh, have to be drawn, and this is the purple line, uh, replacing the old ones, which is the blue dot, which are the blue dotted lines. With the new lines, each district now contains six people. So now again, we have population equality. Next slide. So democracy depends on voters having the opportunity to choose their representatives. Uh, when elected officials redraw the lines of their own districts every 10 years, they get to design their own territory and choose who their voters are. So gerrymandering happens when the election district boundaries are drawn in a way that gives a particular set of people, like a, like a uh, political party or a racial group, an unfair political advantage over another across the, the districts within that jurisdiction. So for better or worse, different segments of populations uh, have differing political views. These views may be connected to race, income, uh, where people live, uh, as well as a, a political party. So uh, where there are these differences in viewpoints, uh, the way district maps are drawn can determine whether a group of people have the ability to elect candidates of their choice or at least influence the outcome of elections. So uh, if you can right click again, in this example, we have a racial minority uh, a racial minority community that lives in the center of our city, Happyville. Um, but if the people in charge of drawing the lines don't pay attention to where that minority community is, they might draw the district lines th this way, as we see here, uh, which in this way, they're perfectly compact. However, they split the minority population into four districts. And this minority community cannot elect a candidate of their choice now because they are diluted across all of those districts. Uh, uh, so sometimes the way lines are drawn is intended to dilute the votes of a group, which is unfortunate, but it happens. Uh, and this same dynamic plays out uh, with any group that is politically cohesive, uh, but have views that are different from the majority of the population. So that's why uh, it's important that we uh, make sure that certain groups um, who are a minority, but are a protected class, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, at least have uh, the opportunity to uh, vote someone in to represent them uh, within their uh, jurisdiction. Next slide. Uh, but things uh, could be different. So uh, an example of how redistricting could play out or, or has played out in jurisdictions in California in many instances because of laws that we have, um, so we could draw lines uh, in another way. And if you could uh, right click again, that this community could, could unite to tell the drawers to pay attention to where they are. So through public participation, this uh, 
uh, minority group can show up to redistricting hearings and whatnot and advocate for lines that are drawn, such as we see here, where at least they, they either have a majority within a particular district to uh, potentially elect representation of their choice, or at least they have enough influence within that district to um, influence the outcome of who's elected in that district. So now we see here in our, our fictitious example, Happyville, the lines are drawn uh, to take into consideration the community that's at the center of the city. Uh, and they and that group has mostly been made whole. It's impossible often to put all of a particular group in a district and you don't necessarily always wanna do that because um, you get into um, terms that you've probably heard called cracking and packing. Uh, Packing is where you, you cram a particular group into one district so that they don't have voting power across districts or cracking is where you dilute them across many districts so that they don't have influence in any one district. So that all that said, uh, after equal population is achieved, the next most important rule in redistricting is the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and the Voting Rights Act can provide protection for uh, racial and ethnic minorities in situations like this. And just to give you an example of how redistricting, bad redistricting can affect a community, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague, Kaylin here for this next section. Next slide. Thank you for that fantastic overview, Sean. I think we have a great grasp now on what redistricting looks like in abstract. So let's figure out the principles that govern it more so and what can actually happen with redistricting. So next slide, please. So all of those great population shifts that Sean mentioned is changing how many people you have in a district are determined obviously by the census. Uh, that's conducted every 10 years. We had one in 2020-ish, more like 2021 based on how things went. And that determines how many people are obviously in your district. And that's what ends up necessitating redistricting. If your districts are not balanced, then you need to redistrict. Next slide, please. So when you're doing local redistricting, you're effectively picking who voters can vote for and who they're voting alongside. So whatever policies that they want to pursue are going to be influenced by the people that they're located in a district with. So here we see some examples, health, equity, environmental justice, policing, law enforcement, housing. Those are some pretty common ones. Just as a quick example in this situation, if you, and this is something that happened in Escondido, if you live in a high fire area, you probably want to be in a district with other people that are also at risk from fires because you have a similar environmental concern. Your district catches on fire regularly. So it would be beneficial if all of the people that you're voting with have similar interests as you. So it's important that you are put in a district with people that share your concerns. Next slide, please. So we're going to cover an example of this that happened back in 2003 in the city of Watts, California, that really shows the importance of making sure that communities are kept together and how redistricting changes how much say the people have in the halls of power. Next slide, please. So on November 12, 2003, there was a freak storm in Watts that caused extensive flooding, snow damage, 150 buildings and homes were damaged, 50,000 people lost power, 6,000 people sought aid from some emergency provider, and really nobody did anything about this. FEMA refused to act, um, and even though Governor Gray Davis at the time declared a state of emergency six days after the flood, nobody was helping Watts. It was ignored. There are many reasons for that, but one of them is redistricting. So let's see why. Next slide, please. Watts did not have a single member of Congress to appeal to. They had three, which makes it a lot harder because it means that Watts as, it's, as a whole is not a priority for any one single member of Congress. You can see here, it is split into three different districts. So if they wanna get anything done for the city as a whole, they would need three different members of Congress to all coordinate on a response, all go talk to FEMA. That is a lot harder to do than having a single congressional office to go to and say, my city has been flooded, we need help. Now you might say at this point, well, that's unfortunate they can't go to Congress. What about the state legislature? Next slide, please. They are also divided into three lines at the state legislature as well, which means not only do they not have a single representative for their district to go to at Congress, 
but in the state legislature and the state Senate, they also do not have a single representative to go to. There is no one advocate for Watts that exists. It is nobody's primary concern because of how this redistricting played out. Next slide, please. So here we have a member of our, a staffer for a former member of Congress explaining the issue. And you can see this, I mean, they, they say it better than I ever could. This would not have happened if Watts was in one district, because then that one district of Watts would be a major constituent block for whatever political representative is supposed to be helping them in this situation. So we see what happens when redistricting goes bad. You don't get the help that you need for your community because no one is there to represent you. How did this happen in the first place? Next slide, please. Secrecy, government doing things behind our back. Everybody's favorite thing, it's not good. So after 9-11, shockingly this comes into it, there was a sweetheart deal rushed through by the state legislature that created favorable districts for both parties. They wanna protect incumbents. That is the nature of politics. If you are in power, you probably wanna stay in power. So they drew districts in a way that kept people in power. And the tragic side effect of that was Watts came to be split between three different districts. Now, fortunately, we're not gonna end on that note because things are about to get better. Next slide, please. Obviously, this was unconscionable. You cannot have an entire city abandoned by not just the state government, but by the federal government as well. So in 2008, using a bill that California Common Cause helped co-sponsor, we passed the Voters First Act in the California State Legislature, which took power away from the state legislature to do redistricting and returned it to the citizens. It created an independent commission responsible for drawing the lines for the state legislature. So if we look at the next slide, please. Look at that. Watts is now all in one district. It has one congressperson to appeal to, one member of the state legislature to appeal to. When something goes poorly, there is a single representative whose job it is to make sure that Watts is doing well. That is their priority, their voice is heard, and hopefully there will never be a flood in Watts again. But if there is some other issue in Watts, if they have concerns about environmental justice, if they have concerns about policing, they know that they have one person who they can go to and say, we would like these issues fixed. We are united. We are your constituents. Can you help us? So hopefully that gives an idea of how at the federal and state level redistricting changes what kind of aid and support you can get from the government. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sean to talk about the 2020 redistricting process at large and a lot of the things that we saw with it. So next slide, please. Excellent. Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, yes. So now that we, we've kind of gone through the, you know, what redistricting is and why it's important, we're going to look at specifically now um, some of the good and the bad that happened in this redistricting cycle, both at the state level here in California and nationally. Uh, next slide. So before we do that, though, we just wanted to pre briefly uh, let you know what California Common Cause's role was over the last couple of years in, in this current redistricting cycle. So we monitored over 50 jurisdictions across California. Uh, Kaylin was a big part of that effort here in this region. Uh, we worked with our partners, including League of Women Voters in over a dozen jurisdictions in California. Uh, we supported the efforts of numerous activists and coalitions. Uh, we submitted dozens of letters to city councils uh, and boards of supervisors, and we spoke at redistricting hearings. Uh, we provided advice on the redistricting process and its laws um, uh, to, on communities of interest. Uh, we provided extensive resources on our website. They're still available, by the way, to facilitate uh, public participation and understanding of uh, state redistricting laws. And finally, we assisted city and county staff in implementing the Fair Maps Act uh, correctly. And I'll get into in just a second what the Fair Maps Act is, but it's a piece of legislation that California Common Cause um, also helped to craft. Um, and before we go to the next slide, I just wanna uh, say that because Co California Common Cause and just Common Cause in general, we're a nonpartisan organization. So when we were, monitoring these meetings, we did not take positions of support or non-support on any of the maps. Uh, but what we did do is weigh in on the legal compliance aspects of uh, the maps and the redistricting process. Okay, next slide. All right, so first we're gonna look at some of the good things that happened 
in California. Uh, and, and, and the good news is, is that we live in a state where we have uh, some of the best food districting laws. Um, and one of those laws is um, called the Fair Maps Act, which it was implemented in 2019. Uh, and just uh, to give you the full name of the act, uh, the acronym stands for the Fair and Inclusive Redistricting for, mis for Municipalities and Political Subdivisions. Uh, so it, again, it was implemented in 2019 and it set parameters uh, for jurisdictions to follow uh, that included um, an order, a ranked order criteria and public education uh, and outreach requirements. Um, the FMA or Fair Maps Act uh, uh, required jurisdictions uh, to consider public feedback and preserve uh, communities of interest or what we call COIs for short as much as possible. And, and this was very important because in previous law, this, this concept of a community of interest, it was written into law, but there was really no mandate or protocol on how much uh, a jurisdiction had to take that public feedback into account when they were drawing lines. The Fair Maps Act said, no, it's a very important part of the process. And indeed, you have to take it into account when you're drawing lines. Uh, and so uh, we also saw though another good thing that happened at the state level is that the state commission, uh, also known as the Citizens uh, Redistricting Commission or CRC, was very successful. Um, uh, there were over 35,000 instances of public testimony at the state level for the Citizens Redistricting Commission. The maps were not challenged in court. And this is kind of unprecedented. Maps are always challenged. State maps are always challenged in court. So the fact that the citizens redistricting maps, love them or hate them, the fact that they weren't challenged in court uh, kind of speaks multitudes about um, the efficacy of the process uh, and the fact that the final maps were on strong legal ground in terms of um, the commission having taken in robust public feedback and adjusting those maps constantly based on that public feedback that they were getting. Uh, and so essentially what that tells us is that the system, this independent redistricting system, it worked as it was supposed to work. Um, so that was, that was something, uh, I think a highlight, uh, not just in California, but across the country on how well our independent commission worked because it's now being used as a model across other states. Uh, another good aspect in California this cycle was the amount of uh, public participation locally. Um, when I say locally, so now we're talking about at the county uh, and the, the uh, city level. So we saw record public participation in many large jurisdictions. And this happened in the midst of a pandemic. So um, th that, that was pretty amazing. Now, I will say, ironically, because of the pandemic, uh, jurisdictions were induced to use uh, remote access, which probably played a significant role in allowing more people to participate since um, rather than having to be physically present at a particular hearing to participate, now they could participate remotely if they wanted to. Next slide. Uh, some other good things include, um, as I mentioned, the independent redistricting commissions, not just at the state level, um, but at the local level, they work really well. So many of the best and least gerrymandered maps were created by independent redistricting commissions uh, at the local level in the state. So an example of, of, of these, some of these jurisdictions where the process worked really well was Long Beach, uh, Escondido. Um, we also mentioned uh, LA County, even though I know some people weren't ultimately happy with the uh, final maps, um, one cannot argue that the alternative of politicians drawing those maps secretly in smoke-filled rooms would, would have resulted in better maps. Uh, so they work, uh, and, and the, as a product of that, independent redistricting commissions are growing in popularity. So since 2010, when the states um, implemented its Citizens Redistricting Commission, which was the first independent redistricting commission in the country, over a dozen local jurisdictions have implemented their own fully independent, independent redistricting commissions. And currently more want them 
you know, so right now uh, we, we're seeing um, local jurisdictions considering converting to fully independent redistricting commissions. Uh, and we're also seeing at this at the currently in the state legislative session, uh, multiple counties uh, have bills right now before uh, the assembly to convert uh, to county independent redistricting commission. And I'll just note too, um, there's also there are also five jurisdictions locally that have what's called a hybrid commission. And what that is, is it's, it's a product between, you have an independent commission that takes public feedback and draws the lines, but the, the city council or the board of supervisors has an opportunity to weigh in at some point about the maps. And then after the, that, uh, the governing body weighs in, it goes back to that independent commission and they may or may not change the lines based on that feedback. Uh, and then I'll, I will also say that um, this particular redistricting cycle um, was extremely important because now in California, we have more my majority minority voting districts than we've ever had before. And that is um, a product of Cali the California Voting Rights Act, uh, which was implemented in um, 2001. And it has induced a massive conversion from at-large voting to by district voting across California. So now we, we in California, we, ha, we, are, we are seeing that we have more minority representation across districts than we've ever had. Next slide. Now, I just wanted to touch upon some of the good things that happened uh, at the national level with redistricting. Again, I wanna to touch upon um, the independent redistricting uh, commissions that work. Um, they started with California, uh, and now uh, we have more states that have adopted them. And regardless of whether you love or hate the maps they produce, uh, the voters are uh, the voters, not politicians, are drawing these lines. So, you know, vo voters should be picking their politicians, not the other way around. Uh, the popularity of these independent redistricting commissions appears to be growing nationally as well. So since 2010, uh, when California became the first state to have non-politicians draw um, federal and state legislative maps, nine states now have independent redistricting commissions. Uh, another uh, good, uh, good thing that happened at the national level, this redistricting cycle, was that state Supreme Courts uh, are more willing to step in now to the process. Uh, so since SCOTUS, the California Supreme Court, I'm sorry, not the, the, the United States uh, Supreme Court uh, ruled in uh, Rucho v. Common Cause that gerrymandering um, is essentially legal unless it violates state constitutions. Um, more state Supreme Courts are weighing in to establish that gerrymandering uh, is illegal. So some of those states uh, include Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Ohio. So because uh, the Supreme, the, 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 the federal Supreme Court has, has basically said, we're going to, we're going to stay out of it <laughs> uh, to some degree, but states, they can weigh in. We are getting more state Supreme Courts weighing in. Uh, and finally, more open source map drawing software is available this redistricting cycle for the public to utilize and access for free so that they can actually, this cycle, they were able to actually use software to draw map. So now let's talk about some of the, the bad things about redistricting. Um, in California, there is still too much gerrymandering at the local level. So most cities and counties still have politicians draw uh, or determine uh, their new maps. Uh, and, and, and some examples of jurisdictions, I would say, include L.A. City, uh, El Cajon, La Mirada, and Bakersfield. We monitored all of these cities. It became evident fairly quickly that um, the politicians in power uh, wanted to make sure that their top priority was staying in power. So um, what happened was you, rather than using public feedback to draw the lines, uh, political preference or, uh, or uh, decision maker preference ended up ruling the day. Uh, also, some dur jurisdictions um, we saw depress public participation by not live streaming the redistricting hearings 
or providing remote public participation. An example of this that we observed was the city of El Cajon. Uh, not only did they not allow for remote public participation, they didn't even record their uh, redistricting hearing meetings. So as California Common Cause, we were wholly reliant upon our partners down in that area and League of Women Voters was, was one of those partners for them to go to the meetings in person uh, and provide us with, you know, kind of debrief us on things that occurred there. And what happened was, is you, you had minimal participation. You had a, a group of folks that did show up and, and, and participated. But I, I think that it's, a, it's fair to say there would have been much more participation if um, it was easier to participate in El Cajon. Also, there is still too little oversight, especially in small jurisdictions. Uh, the focus tends to be on large cities or counties, both in the media and with watchdog groups. So some of the smaller jurisdictions just get overlooked. Uh, there's also uh, far too many media deserts. Um, to prov you know, so we, what happens is we don't get robust uh, media coverage. Um, uh, in some of these smaller jurisdictions where there's essentially no local media or, or, or press anymore. Uh, and finally, it, it's become clear to us that advisory commissions um, are not uh, really a viable alternative to an, a fully independent commission. And the example of this uh, is uh, LA City. They have what's called an advisory commission uh, it's not politicians um, who are taking the public feedback and, and drawing the initial lines. Um, it is, however, that advisory commission, um, they, they really have no power. Uh, it's almost like window dressing uh, for the people who do have power. Because at the end of the day, the city council members have complete control over what the final maps are going to look like. So they can take that advisory commission map and throw it out the window and draw their own maps. And that's kind of what happened in Los Angeles again this year. So um, we're, we've kind of moved away from promoting that advisory commission model and we, we really believe in the independent model. Next slide. So uh, nationally, some, other, some, some bad things that happened at the national level. So 2021, we saw the most aggressive uh, and prevalent gerrymandering ever. Uh, Technology has allowed politicians the ability to pick their voters to the extreme. And that's only going to uh, increase as technology increases. So uh, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, also, um, SCOTUS continues to chip away at the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, for those who are not that familiar with it, Federal Voting Rights Act is really a seminal piece of legislation that came out of the um, you know, kind of the uh, movement uh, in the 60s uh, that essentially ensured that uh, everyone has certain rights under the laws and that gerrymandering is mitigated uh, on racial grounds. Uh, however, what has happened over the last 10 years is that uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, they got rid of a part of that Federal Voting Rights Act, which was a part called preclearance. And that preclearance uh, part of the leg of the uh, law said states who had a history of uh, racial discrimination, they first had to get uh, base, uh, just the approval from the Justice Department um, before they could uh, create new uh, district maps. And so that's gone now. That's out of that, that kind of safeguard is gone. Uh, and now it looks like the Supreme Court is also chipping away at the, the really the only relevant piece of that law left, which is the um, Section 2, which is essentially the part of the Federal Voting Rights Act that says, um, if we can prove that you um, are discriminating against a particular protected class through your, your line drawing, then it's illegal. And um, I think in some of the recent rulings uh, at the, uh, on state Maps. SCOTUS has indicated, at least a majority of SCOTUS has indicated they're they're very willing to either get rid of Section Two or essentially make it irrelevant, which is not a good thing. 
Um, and all of this is to say, all of these things that are happening, I guess, a rigged system is very hard to unrig. So, um, for example, if I'm in power, uh, I don't want to. I don't. I, I want to stay in power, and I'm going to make it extremely difficult for you to change the system that allows me to stay in power. So um, that's what we're up against. Uh, and to top it all off, the U.S. has the most uh, is currently the most politically polarized it, it's been in the last 100 years. So we kind of have an uphill battle to to unrig, uh, you know, this process. And with, with that, I'm going to turn it over one more time to uh, my colleague, Kaylin, and he can talk about a little bit about how uh, all of this redistricting might impact voting over the next 10 years. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, next slide, please. And I think if there's any takeaway from a lot of the stuff you just talked about, I think it's that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, but critically, we have the tools to address it, namely independent redistricting commissions. So. Let's talk about the impact on voting that redistricting has. Next slide, please. So of course, it's gonna vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Even cities and counties that use similar models are gonna have different results based on how things happen. So maybe a city redistricts well, people are represented and things are good. Maybe a city does not redistrict well and there's a lot of gerrymandering that occurs. And that actually is how that word is pronounced, gerrymandering. I hate it too, but apparently we have to say it. So. It's going to be gerrymandering. So there are good things that can typically happen in California. One of those things Sean mentioned this piece of legislation already is the California Voting Rights Act. It makes it a lot easier to transition from at-large elections to district-based elections. Very few cities have successfully won a case brought under the California Voting Rights Act. And that's a good thing because as a result of the California Voting Rights Act, we have seen a 10 to 12 percent increase of minority representation on city councils across California. So its goal of making sure that redistricting by going from at-large elections to by district elections, least greater minority representation has been achieved. That is exactly what you wanna see. It's great that that's happening across the state. Next slide, please. So now we are going to talk about Pasadena. Pasadena was one of the first cities that I monitored with California Common Cause. It is a very long, very interesting redistricting process. It was done by an advisory commission. So, so just to go over what that means, an advisory commission draws maps. It is responsible for collecting public input. However, the final map that it produces is not binding. The city council can accept or reject it at will. So as Sean mentioned in Los Angeles City, there is an advisory commission. They drew a map. The city council rejected the map drawn by the advisory commission and passed their own map. In Pasadena, the city council actually accepted the map done by the advisory commission, but we'll talk about some of the issues with that. One of the most critical things to remember from the Pasadena redistricting process, downtown Pasadena organized and wanted to be placed in a single district. It is currently not in a single district. I think it is in at least three, if not more, because of the policy of having every single district in Pasadena touch Colorado Boulevard. Some people say that's because they want an equal economic interest in that area. Other people point out that it's probably because the Rose Parade goes along Colorado Boulevard and every district wants a piece of that action. Next slide, please. So at the very beginning of the process, the Pasadena Advisory Commission declared that they wanted to pursue a policy of minimal change. That is exactly what that sounds like. They did not want to change the district lines any more than was absolutely necessary to be in compliance with the constitution, demanding that every single district have the same population. Uh, this is a massive issue, not necessarily in and of itself, but because of what it leads to. It means that you're prioritizing something above communities of interest. You're prioritizing something above compactness. You're prioritizing something above rational district lines. You're saying, or in this case, the advisory commission is saying, we want things to stay the same as much as possible above basically anything else that we have going. And obviously this was the issue that the downtown advocates encountered when they asked for a single district to be made. That would have been a massive change, but since there was this existing policy of minimal change, the advisory commission ignored them and at one point argued that the downtown area of Pasadena did not even count as a community of interest and that the advisory commission had the authority to determine what a community of interest was, not the people themselves. That is untrue. The community of interest is defined by itself and downtown Pasadena absolutely counted 
as a community of interest under the definition laid out by the Fair Maps Act. Next slide, please. So that's kind of what happened in Pasadena. We saw a minimal change map passed. The downtown district is still divided between multiple different areas, but nationally we have, you know, a lot of the similar issues. Both parties gerrymander, that is, or gerrymander, that is the case. I think right now we're seeing um, a lot of fighting going on in Maryland because the Democratic Party has done a lot of gerrymandering there. The Republican Party was accused of gerrymandering in Ohio, I believe. Both parties do it. It is slightly more prevalent in the GOP simply because there are more gubernatorial offices controlled by the GOP. That is simply the fact of the matter. This is an issue mostly because it depresses the ability for people to primary incumbents. So you end up with the same people in power because districts are made by the parties to keep their people in the halls of power, regardless of what the voters for either party actually wants. So that's kind of what happens when you don't have good redistricting processes. The people that lose out aren't necessarily one party or the other. It's just the people that wanna see their interests represented in office their people up there making decisions for them. So at the end of the day, it's really not Democrat versus Republican. It's not government versus people. It's just voters against the people that want to make sure that they can't actually pick their own candidates. So this has been a little bit more succinct. Um, hopefully, Sean can end us on an uplifting note after talking about some of these losses and you know how the downtown district in Pasadena might one day be re reunited in 2030. But you know, that remains to be seen. So Sean, back to you. All right, thanks, Kaylin. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think it's, it was good to point out. And uh, the, down, the Pasadena Downtown Association, they're just, uh, you know, one of many communities of interest. Um, uh, they, you know, that spoke up in Pasadena, but um, there are similar uh, communities of interest across all cities that, that show up uh, and define who they are and why. Uh, it, it's important for them to remain whole within a district or or two. So uh, thanks for that, Kaylin. Next slide. Uh, we're almost done here, just a couple more slides left, but we thought we'd, we'd, we'd end on uh, kind of the future or moving forward um, to uh, essentially getting us to the next redistricting cycle, which isn't until 2030. But there's a lot of things that can be done in the meantime to improve that that uh, redistricting cycle. Next slide. So how can the process uh, improve in California? So even though California has some some very good laws that uh, other states um, often in, emulate, uh, uh, we there there we can amend uh, the Fair Maps Act to make it even better. Uh, so, for example, we've learned there are ways that the Fair Max can act, can be improved, uh, especially around enforcement, participation, and access to uh, materials. One thing that we uh, are considering is requiring jurisdictions to post uh, much earlier than what they have been posting uh, live streams of uh, public hearings as well as uh, minutes uh, and access to materials. Uh, may, another way that uh, we can improve the process in California is uh, to make uh, independent redistricting commissions the norm. Uh, so more residents uh, are demanding these independent commissions and more jurisdictions are seriously considering them. Um, so we should support this, this positive trend. Uh, currently, uh, LA City and San Bernardino City are considering a transition to fully independent redistricting commissions. And uh, at, at the county level, Kern County, Fresno County, and Riverside County all have bill, bills before the state assembly um, at the moment to transition to independent commissions. Also, ensuring local press thrives um, is extremely important because without local coverage, um, without a local press to um, not just um, kind of watchdog the process, but also kind of break it down for the public so that they know what's going on uh, and they're reporting on the different aspects of the process that's going on in a particular jurisdiction so that other people who may not necessarily know or be interested in it, they may read something about it in the press and decide that, hey, I do want to participate. Uh, so local press is paramount to a strong democracy and 
unfortunately, I, I guess probably dying, the local press is dying is maybe um, too strong uh, <laughs> uh, of a word to use, but it, it's definitely diminishing. Uh, and so we need to make sure that it thrives. And I just wanted to mention a bill here, SB 11, which is currently in uh, the state uh, uh, Senate, uh, which California Common Cause is uh, co-sponsoring, uh, which would, uh, in order to try and ensure that local press thrives, it'll create a state board that will administer a $50 million public fund to distribute grants to local press and media. Uh, so that's one way that uh, we might be able to address that issue moving forward. Next slide. And at the national level, um, federal laws are needed. Um, so the, the, jo the John R. Lewis uh, Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act will significantly help um, if, it, if it is able to pass. So what uh, that act would do would reestablish this pre-clearance process that we talked about that the Supreme Court um, did away with. Uh, this last decade, and it would also overhaul our um, campaign finance reform system at the federal level, which is needed so that um, a handful of wealthy special interests don't control the narrative and, quite frankly, determine who our electeds and representatives will be. Uh, more, also at the national level, more independent commissions are needed. Um, so we know that these independent commissions work, uh, and we know that the alternative is politicians picking their voters. So we, you know, if, if this, and it seems to be the IRCs or independent redistricting commissions seem to be gaining in popularity. So if they spread uh, uh, at the state level, that would be a very good thing. Uh, also, a realignment of, of SCOTUS thinking is needed. So for things to, to really change, we need uh, US Supreme Court judges who believe that gerrymandering, can't say gerrymandering, I know it's the right way, is unconstitutional. Um, and that, that's not likely to happen anytime soon. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't advocate for it. Uh, also, more states need to implement redistricting and voting rights legislation like California has. One of the interesting um, byproducts of the Rucho v. Common Cause Supreme Court ruling where, that essentially made gerrymandering legal was that uh, Chief Justice John Roberts said, however, state Supreme Courts can, or state constitutions can make their own judgment calls on whether gerrymandering is legal or not. And so uh, one way you might see other states start to adopt models like California has in terms of the California Voting Rights Act, since the Federal Voting Rights Act is, is being diminished. And you also may start to see more states amend their constitutions, uh, as well as Supreme Court, or I'm sorry, state Supreme Courts weighing in on the constitutionality of gerrymandering. And so if you make clear, so it's, for example, uh, I believe it's the Ohio, uh, the state of Ohio, they actually amended their constitution to say that um, redistricting based on um, uh, politi purely political party grounds is unconstitutional. So now uh, it's very clear that gerrymandering is not legal. And it also makes it a lot harder for the US Supreme Court to come in now and say, well, we think you're misinterpreting your constitution, state Supreme Court, because it's clearly outlined in the constitution. There's no vagary going on. So those are all things that can happen between now and 2030 that would improve um, the redistricting process, uh, as well as the, um, you know, quite frankly, democracy <laughs> to ensure that uh, we're all represented fairly and equally and that the system is not rigged towards one particular group or party or another, but the people have more control. And with that, I will go ahead and end and open it up to questions. We can go to the next slide. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you. I think uh, I've, uh, 
I'm not sure if I'm on screen. So I want to thank you for your presentations and the information you gave us. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience, but I was going to ask you, you know, you mentioned about what's happening at state levels in those jurisdictions. Is there anything that voters as individuals can do? Would they be um, open to, you know, maybe uh, challenging the work being done um, locally because they've been disenfranchised to some extent? Yeah, uh, that's that's a great question. And there there is, uh, it, actually it's very important that uh, residents get involved and advocate for uh, a better process um, some states make it easier than others. So, for example, California, we have an initiative process where the voter, the voters can actually take things to the ballot. Um, and we also have, um, I think, a, a Supreme Court in California that is, is more open to the idea that um, uh, gerrymandering is, is not a legal process. Uh, so when the residents get involved in these other states, there's, way, there's ways that they can affect uh, this change and induce this change, uh, especially if they have the initiative process. But if they don't have that initiative process, it, it's really contingent upon very strong advocacy, both at the local and the state level, uh, to really put the pressure on the politicians that are preventing these good reforms from going through. Um, and I know that may not seem like an ideal situation, but that's kind of what we're left with. And yes, we can we can um, get lawyers involved, which um, they should get involved if there's an egregious abuse here uh, in terms of redistricting that's disenfranchising certain groups of people. But unfortunately, um, uh, it's gotten to the point where even our state Supreme Court judges uh, and judges at all levels, uh, quite frankly, are being uh, the extreme amounts of money flowing into politics are affecting who is getting elected, or who is becoming our who are becoming our judges to make these rulings. So um, when I talk about the system being rigged, um, to some degrees it is because of basically un there are no guardrails left in our democracy in terms of what uh, money can do to uh, manipulate the process. So. Uh, strong advocacy, though, can make a difference, and it has made a difference in a lot of local jurisdictions. Also, the media reporting on this and just being very consistent um, and, and, and not letting up it plays a big role as well. I, it, it does seem a little bit um, as if we're under quite a bit of, you know, a deluge of rocks that we have to rise up from in order to overcome the, this situation that's been growing because, you know, it's my understanding that this one decision in uh, 2013 uh, to gut that portion of preclearance on the Voting Rights Act that there's actually been a consistent chipping away by various court decisions over a long period of time, probably since the, you know, 2000 or so that it's really kind of been quite consistent. So this is just a trend that we're seeing. And, you know, I was talking to a friend and I said, you know, it seems like we fought this fight <laughs> in the 60s and it feels horrible to be uh, facing it again. But we did have a question about uh, with SCOTUS having gotten the, gutted the Voting Rights Act via preclearance, as I talked about, and possible uh, via section two, what is common cause finding as a major challenges to the um, independent redistricting commissions in states other than California? And what can be done going forward? Because we have a lot of sister leagues who are interested. So uh, yeah, just to clarify is the question then what are kind of the roadblocks to getting the independent redistricting commissions implemented in the Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think again, it kind of goes back to uh, the answer from my previous question, from the previous question, is uh, it makes a big difference if a state has allows for an initiative process. So in Michigan, um, the the voters took something to the ballot and created the independent commission, uh, and so it made it much more difficult for 
um, the politicians in power to say, we're not going to recognize um, the will of the people in this instance. Um, I also think it makes a big difference too, um, if you, uh, what the makeup of your state Supreme Court is, um, if they're inclined to interpret your state constitution in a way that uh, is going to put roadblocks or, or simply um, prevent uh, you know, a, an independent commission from, from being recognized or implemented, then again, you come back to this issue of, well, how are these judges on the Supreme Court getting there? And again, it comes back to money. So uh, in that particular instance, you also have to figure out at the grassroots level, not just to advocate and get uh, judges in place that, that um, view uh, this idea that uh, gerrymandering <laughs> is constitutional, uh, essentially flip the courts uh, to say, no, this is, this is actually not something that is, is democratic and reasonable constraints uh, to mitigate this uh, gerrymandering uh, can happen. And, and independent commissions play a, um, a significant role in that. And it makes it, I will just say one last point on this. If a state successively um, implements an independent commission, it really makes it much, much harder for the courts at the state or federal level to step in and say, your maps uh, are, are unconstitutional or they have to be thrown out because it's the politicians aren't drawing the maps and there's strong requirements in these independent commissions that say you have to take into account public feedback. It doesn't say, that's not to say that the Federal Voting Rights Act still doesn't apply. What's left of it still applies. Uh, and these some of these uh, maps, even from independent commissions, can be taken to court if they think that they're in violation of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, so that's why it's important that we still at least have um, portions of the Federal Voting Rights Act available uh, for use in case uh, you know, we see extreme gerrymanderings happening, not just uh, by politicians, but if, for instance, they do happen with an independent commission, even if it's unintentional. So correct me if I'm wrong, what it means is what we're left with is that the harm has to occur first, then you have to challenge it before uh, you can get it rectified, if you can prove it, and as opposed to pre-clearance that it prevented harm from happening. Uh, um, when that was put in place. Exactly. Uh, what preclearance did was essentially take the courts out of the role of policing uh, certain states in terms of whether their maps were constitutional or not. The uh, Justice Department basically weighed in and said, yes, they are, or no, they're not. And you have to go back and redo them so that they are adhering uh, to the Federal Voting Rights Act and they are not discriminating against a particular protected class. Now that that's gone, you can now courts, and unfortunately courts are becoming more and more partisan, are, are deciding we are going to weigh in. Um, so, and they're making what, in many instances, not all instances, uh, but in many instances, they're making uh, political decisions as opposed to um, what many of us believe to be a true reading uh, and interpretation of the law. If I could jump in on that point really quick, sure. talk about some of the major damage that has occurred because of the lack of preclearance and how sometimes even appeals aren't enough. There's this thing in Supreme Court doctrine called the Purcell Principle, which very basically states, you do not want to make big changes to how an election is going to be occurred if that election is happening soon. So you could plausibly, and I believe this happened in Alabama, you could plausibly have district lines be drawn that actively racially gerrymander congressional districts that can be proven in court and it is established. And you can go to the courts and this has happened. They will say, those lines are unconstitutional, but because we're so close to the election because of the Purcell principle, you are still going to have to hold an election using those district lines. After that election, you can redraw the district lines. Maybe there's gonna be a special election with new district lines. Maybe you have to wait until the next regularly scheduled election. But even if you have a successful appeal, if you do not get it done soon enough, it is, if it is not successful soon enough, you are still going to have to work with those unconstitutional racist district lines, which really is why it's so critical that you get the process right the first time. The only way to avoid that happening 
is to not have bad lines in the first place. And that is why it is so essential we create independent redistricting commissions. And why, again, it is essential that people get involved and make sure that their elected politicians are not appointing judges that are going to look at lines and say, gerrymandering is not our concern because they care more about party than the constitution or the people. <laughs> this is why I think that it was so painful to watch what happened um, a lot. <laughs> I blame COVID because it was very difficult for us to get in touch with those communities who aren't connected already. Did you happen to notice a gap in terms of residents that were engaged? I'll speak first and then I'll go ahead and let Galen weigh in on this too because he, he has some experience with this as well. Uh, yes, we, we did. And obviously the communities who have less access um, uh, to internet, um, uh, uh, live close by to city halls, or simply, quite frankly, communities that um, are poor, uh, who don't have the time uh, to essentially learn about the process and, and take the time out to participate in the process, they're very, uh, reliant upon um, what we call grass tops organizations to, to get out and do some really uh, knocking on their doors and um, holding community meetings where, you know, taking the message to the people where they're at, as opposed to, um, you know, mandating that those people come to you to learn about the process. So we saw some of that done very effectively in Los Angeles, um, but in general, Yes, those communities that are marginalized, those that speak English as a second language, immigrant communities, also communities of color uh, and low income communities are, are often um, the communities that are least participate in the process for various reasons. So, um, you know, it's incumbent upon us uh, as organizations, but uh, it's also incumbent upon our, our decision makers and our leaders to make sure that when we're doing the messaging, it's not just getting to, you know, the, the middle class or the people who have access or uh, to the information over the internet, but it's getting to the people also who are less likely to have access, uh, you know, to technology that allows them to get on the internet. Uh, I think Long Beach did that well. Long Beach sent out notices in electric bills, water bills. Uh, they had billboard signs. Um, they had, you know, signs at the bus stops that, that talked about the commission process and how to participate. And as a result, I, I monitored those meetings and I saw a very diverse group of people show up and advocate for their communities of interest. Uh, and I'll go ahead and let Kaylin speak on that as well. Yeah, and just before I cover that, and I'm not supposed to be looking at the Q&A or the chat, but I saw a really critical question about whether or not um, political parties can count as communities of interest. The Fair Max Act explicitly says that they cannot, that a community of interest cannot be understood as having relation to a political party. So just because it has such a nice cut and dry answer in state statutes, thought that I could toss that one out there. But yeah, I mean, Sean brought up a critical point about how class like plays a role in this. There is a class component to redistricting. The fact of the matter is that it takes time to go give testimony at a city council or county supervisor hearing. It takes time to learn how to use mapping software and submit a map. And chances are, if you are working multiple jobs, if you have really long shifts at your jobs, the last thing you wanna do when you get home after working an incredibly long shift, presumably doing some kind of difficult labor, is go hop on your computer if you have one and wait for two hours to be able to like give a two minute comment about where you want your district to be. That is exhausting. So there is this really fundamental issue of the people that probably are the most damaged by not having good district lines are also the people that have the greatest burdens to participation. So you can kind of see, I think we saw this a lot in Pasadena, the people that were coming to comment were people that were typically calling in from wealthier neighborhoods. They're people that probably don't work, uh, if not a regular nine to five job. They're the kind of people that definitely have the ability to take the time out of their day to hop on a Zoom call, go to a city council hearing or the advisory commission meeting and say, hey, I'd like the district lines to be in this place. Even for downtown Pasadena, which is a more renter based community, which is, it has more people of color in it than a lot of the rest of Pasadena. Most of the people that were calling in on behalf of it were people that were upper middle class, people that were white identifying. So 
there is this really big issue of the people that we're really trying to reach the most with redistricting are the people that have the most roadblocks to actually being able to participate for no other reason than that they have other things going on in their lives. If you are trying to work to eat, redistricting probably isn't your first priority. And I think this kind of goes back to one of the great points that Sean brought up earlier. Money and politics imbalances power massively. And I think until we have the ability for people to be more economically secure, you know, it's going to be harder for them. So common causes work with public financing for elections. That's another conversation. But yeah, the wealth. Sorry, yeah, please. No, go ahead. I, I think that we can start recognizing how all these pieces fit together. Yeah. Campaign financing reform, transparency, getting the census right, because I think we have intuitively a, a, a feeling that there was a severe undercount especially in LA County, just as there was in 2010. Do you have any information related to whether or not that may be true? Yeah, Sean, was it 1.5 million or 15 million that was the undercount nationwide? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yes, recent, recent studies have come out that, that have basically confirmed that there was an extreme undercount and that that undercount, surprise, surprise, occurred uh, within the uh, communities of color uh, or the immigrant communities. So uh, again, you, what happened was you have the people who are probably most in need of strong representation being uh, the same groups that were uh, marginalized or left out of the process um, because of uh, some of the policies this time around um, for, the, for, for the census process compounded by the pandemic as well. So you had multiple things going on um, that really created an imbalance and unfortunately, I think resulted in, in certainly a marginalization, if not a disenfranchisement of a significant portion of people, which will have consequences for the next 10 years. And hopefully in 2030, the census will be better, hopefully. Uh, yes. Um... I think we have uh, maybe time for one more question and I'm looking here. I, people wanted to know how, how did our commissioners get selected and placed on these independent commissions? I think maybe for the state and the county, you don't have to go into all the details because I know it was a comprehensive process, which is good. But if you could just kind of let us know, how did that happen? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to how, how uh, what the model, what kind of some of the models are for the state and local level, and then um, if Galen, he may have some um, insight into how I know Pasadena's is an advisory commission, but how they were picked. But in general, uh, there's there's a couple of models on, for how you can pick uh, independent commissions to ensure that the impartiality. Um, you know, so one model the model at the state level, essentially because. Partisan, it, it's impossible to take partisan politics out of the process. So at the at the state level, they have a process where you you have to have a certain number of uh, Democrats and a certain number of Republicans, as well as a certain number of no party preference or um, uh, parties other than the two primary parties uh, making a ruling. And then you can also put in place that in order to pass the final maps, a super majority of, of the uh, commissioners have to uh, agree. Um, there's, there's also at the federal or at the um, local level, you can also do it um, where the first, let's say you have a total of um, 12, uh, 12 or 14 commissioners, the, they go through a vetting process that's non-political. Say for instance, um, uh, the politicians aren't involved in picking or, or vetting the applicants. You have an application process um, and a third party does that. It could be a set of judges. And then they pick uh, the, the first six and then they have a random drawing um, of the, the next six. And then those 12 combined, they pick, uh, they collectively, they pick who the, who the final um, commissioners are gonna be. So there's different models. Those are a couple. Um, but uh, uh, Kaylin, I don't know if you have anything uh, to add about uh, uh, Pasadena's model. Yeah, so the rules for advisory commissions tend to be a little different. Um, 
the commissioners for Pasadena's advisory commission were picked by the mayor, city council members, I believe the city attorney, and I think the city controller may have also picked one. But typically with advisory commissions, there are, we'll just call them looser rules governing what the exact process would be. There are other jurisdictions like Escondido where the commissions are picked by judges. So three retired judges will be asked to create a commission and they'll just have a blanket requirement of it has to be X many people and you can't do any partisanship considerations. So there are a lot of different methods for it. Um, I think generally, I mean, common cause supports whatever gets you an independent redistricting commission, but it's nice when you steer away from partisanship in the selection. So having just members of a city government, that's one way to achieve that, though it's also nice to take it not just out of the hands of political parties, but out of the hands of uh, sitting elected officials in the first place. So, you know, again, whatever gets you to an IRC, it's pretty good. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you because I think we need to wrap up. We do have a lot of announcements, and I know that there's another um, ballot measure that we want to, um, excuse me, pending law that we want to talk about. And so uh, if, let me see, I think we have, um, yes, uh, we want to um, thank you for letting us know what kind of work remains, because I think that's one of the reasons why I thought it was important. We really have a lot of work to do in order to get those communities of interest that never participated in that second bite. We have a lot of work to do because there's gonna be another census coming up. And I think generally those people that are disenfranchised or further away from equity are the ones that really need to be advised what it is that uh, makes their vote count. Because right now, the way it looks, it sounds like if my vote is worth 1.25 and somebody else's is only worth 0.75, when you come down to it, it's kind of like the way they used to count heads uh, during the slave days, right? Only certain people count as a full body. And in this case, only certain people's vote equals one to one. I voted and it should weigh as much as the next guys. And, and so, you know, this is a big concern to me and I'm hoping that everybody who's listening is ready to partner and really start the work that it's gonna take for us to start going to cities and to various jurisdictions and looking at how they do their uh, redistricting, what processes they put into place, how they're voting, whether it's at large or by district, um, all of those things that actually just end up diluting the vote of certain people if you don't do it right. And so this is why one of the reasons why we wanted to come back and revisit it. All of the long lines have been drawn and it's uh, we're going to potentially obviously live with this for the next 10 years, but it's not necessary for us to stay there and to stay that way. Um, so what I want to do next is move on to, well, first, let me thank uh, my question sorter, Debbie Fagan, who is working in the background and feeding me the questions. And I tried my best to see if I could actually keep one eye on what she was sending me and, uh, and actually uh, listening to you and your responses. But I want to thank her very, very much. Uh, she's a, a really uh, great a member of our Voter Services Committee. So thank you very much, Debbie. And uh, before I uh, share more information about uh, that legislation that we're going to talk about, um, I want to talk about the probable confirmation of Katanji Brown Jackson. If you can please bring that up. Uh, yes. So um, I think it's very, very um, excited. I, it's very exciting. I believe that the vote in the Senate is going to be coming up in about 15 minutes. So when we get out of here, we can all go um, see if we can hear what's going on. Uh, Jackson has served eight years as a federal trial court judge and last June was confirmed for a seat on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. And prior to becoming a judge, she worked as a public defender. Uh, 
Hopefully, once confirmed, she's going to be the first Supreme Court justice since Thurgood Marshall to have represented indigent criminal defendants, which is another perspective there. She graduated from Harvard Law School and was actually a clerk for Justice Stephen Breyer, who's going to retire this summer sometime, and hopefully she will be uh, replacing him. I think that having a perspective of another, um, you know, really qualified uh, person on that court who maybe uh, looks at the laws, in particular those about voting rights and other things, is it's looking bringing in that perspective that we need. And really, with uh, that appointment, we will have a more or less balanced. Uh, gender representation on the court, which I think is really fantastic, or maybe that's the wrong term to use, but I just want to celebrate this moment in anticipation of what I hope will happen later on. Martha, um, this is Catherine, sorry to interrupt, um, uh, live news from the New York Times. She has been confirmed. Yay! then it's not premature. I guess my no. clock is all off. <laughs> it was No, it was just a really quick vote. They started and they finished. She's confirmed. Yay. Well, there we go. We're celebrating now. And so now if uh, you would um, uh, bring up the other uh, slides, I would like to see if what we have here, I think one of the things that we were talking about earlier um, can you put it on so it's, um, yeah, next. Okay, one of the things that Sean talked about is that voting rights, that that legislation really needs to be passed. I don't know if the um, John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act is, um, is still alive in its form, but definitely what we need to do is keep up the pressure. We can't let this drop just because we don't hear about a very nice, clean bill that may be ready to be put before Congress again and go through those motions. Even if we have certain pieces move ahead of others, we need to continue to advocate to protect and expand voting rights for people and you know, kind of undoing the ills of all these court decisions that have come down because it relied on certain interpretations, which as you know, have been interpreted, um, reverse interpretations, you know, starry decisis went out the window some time ago. To reduce the influence of money in politics, we really need to work to make redistricting um, independent and put forth whatever uh, laws can be done federally. And then of course, uh, as mentioned that state to state, wherever there's an opportunity for the people to weigh in, that that gets pushed through because it all affects all of us, right? When someone's disenfranchised somewhere else across the country, it actually does impact Californians. And we have to kind of recognize that we're all in this together. We need to keep pushing. Next slide, please. So what we need you to do is to make sure you contact your senators, even though these two individuals are very supportive, they need to know we have their back, so to speak, and that we actually expect a continued push to try to pass that kind of legislation. So please take action. Next slide, please. We need you to con uh, contact your Congress members too, because again, a lot of the energy has been coming out of the House. So just keep that up. Uh, keep the pressure on all both bodies uh, at this point, because um, when they hurt enough, uh, they'll take action. Uh, next slide. This is where I wa want Sean to talk about SB 1439. Yes, happy to. Uh, SB 1439 is, a, is currently in the um, state Senate. It's a bill making its way through uh, the uh, kind of the, the process of <laughs> uh, becoming a, a, a bill and implemented into law uh, and 
essentially what it does, it's a it's an anti-corruption uh, uh, bill that currently, just briefly, currently there's already law that, that um, says that uh, state agencies, certain state agencies, if they if they uh, take more than two hundred and fifty dollars in uh, political contributions from a particular a particular party who has something before their body, they cannot vote on that um, uh, whether it's an entitlement or um, a a contract, anything. They can't vote on that unless they give that money back. So, but currently, all local jurisdictions are exempt from that law. And so what SB 1439 would do was make uh, local jurisdictions beholden to that law as well. So it would just make it uniform across the state, which would uh, prevent a lot of pay to play uh, and, and, and simply the appearance of pay to play. So both California Common Cause and the California League of Women Voters are official supporters of this bill. And it will have an appropriations hearing on April 18th, and then it will hopefully go to the assembly. Thank you very much. Yes. And so I was really happy to talk about this because I think that all our members can as individuals start uh, with this process. As mentioned, the hearing uh, will be one of the, the next hearing will be on April 18th and it actually goes to Senator Portentino's office, as you know, is one of our great uh, representatives here in the area. And of course you have uh, the various other uh, representatives uh, for our Pasadena area. So please uh, take action. You can um, uh, just uh, go to uh, their websites and uh, contact them. And here's uh, some information for you to follow. Next slide, please. Okay, we have some events coming up. Before I get into that, I really do want to mention that we have two candidate forums coming up this month. So if you can go to um, our website, we will have uh, more information about that. But on April 20th at 6 p.m., the city of Monrovia um, is having city council um, uh, elections. And so at the city council chambers, we're gonna be facilitating a candidate forum for that election. And then on April 22nd at 5 p.m., the Pasadena City Council um, uh, is also having elections coming up on June 7th. So uh, on April 22nd, we're going to facilitate um, a candidate form, forum uh, at the Earth Day Festival in, in Memorial Park. So it's actually going to be open air. And it's anybody attending that festival is able, able to uh, participate and uh, get in there and get some questions um, answered. Uh, so again, uh, for these, this um, next event that we have, League at Night, it's the path to 100% renewable energy opportunities and obstacles, and it features our speakers from the Department of Water and Power, the Sacramento Municipal uh, Utility District, and Pasadena Water and Power. These are individuals who actively work on trying to you know, power our cities. And they have ideas on how they can get off of coal and other uh, fossil fuel, um, you know, um, fuels, <laughs> excuse me, next. And we have Thursday with the league, that's in the morning at 10 a.m. on May 5th, and we'll be talking to the Inspector General for Los Angeles County and talking about what they're doing in terms of um, holding the Sheriff's Department um, accountable uh, for um, policing or, or it's um, policing in our uh, county. And so I hope you will join us for those. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, we hope you enjoyed this program. I wanna thank, you know, um, our common cause uh, partners here, uh, Sean and uh, Kaylin, uh, for such a great program and the knowledge that you have and have passed on to us. And hopefully we'll have opportunities to partner over the next several months, 
perhaps years <laughs> to, um, to do something about redistricting in our local areas because it's such a critical issue to having people um, get that voice that they need, that one voice, one vote uh, concept that um, allows every, or one person, one vote allows everyone to have equal representation the way they were intended by the constitution. And that has gone so wrong over the last several years and seems to be getting worse. Uh, this was a really um, important topic for us to discuss. So thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come out and share your thoughts with us and your ideas about what we can do and the work that still remains to be done. So thank you. And now I just want to thank some more people is that, uh, you know, today's program was recorded by Pasadena Media. Remember that. So please share it with friends and family. What's in, what's once it's available on your YouTube channel, um, you can follow on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Also go to our website next month. Uh, we will have our voters going to be full of information and so is our website about the June 7th primary election so that you can help friends. I know you know how to vote. You know where to find information. We need to get that information out into our communities to the people who don't know it. And in our April voter, you'll see that we offered you a lot of opportunities for you to volunteer uh, out of the comfort of your home without having to leave. Although for some of you, you may want to do that. We still have positions open to do voter registration uh, this Saturday, for example, and also uh, coming the next two weeks at several of our local high schools. So please make sure that you take a look at those opportunities. Um, we've sent out sign up genius call outs and please go ahead and uh, pay attention to that. Thank you to our Zoom hosts, Catherine and Veronica. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. And let's get out there and celebrate the appointment of a new Supreme Court justice. Thank you. We'll see you next time.